Hey everyone, this is uh, Ahmed Parag. I'm one of the um, R3's ESIR candidates at the University of Kentucky, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the uh, communications committee. We are the uh, committee that kind of runs the webinars and helps to make sure everything goes smooth. Um, today we have an awesome, awesome webinar, um, a great PD panel um, organized by uh, the MSC chair, Rayanne Aboud. So without further ado, Rayanne, this is your show. Thank you, Dr. Frog. Uh, we really appreciate all your help in organizing this event. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Aboud. I'm an MS4 at the Wake Forest School, School of Medicine in North Carolina, and I currently serve as the chair of the MSC. Uh, it is my pleasure to moderate this year's widely anticipated program director panel, which is a part of our special COVID-19 webinar series. So please stay tuned for our next webinar in this series, which takes place on Wednesday, June 10th. It will cover medical education resources in IR that can be found on our website. We have many topics to cover, so thank you all for joining us and let's get right to it. Before moving forward, please take 30 seconds to fill out the pre-webinar portion of the survey that was emailed a few hours ago. The link can also be found in the chat box. I will be entering it again. And uh, after the webinar, we will ask that you complete the post-webinar portion of the survey and then submit the survey. A great deal of coordination and thought went into this webinar in hopes of improving the residency application process for this cycle and beyond. So your anonymized feedback will be aggregated to ultimately help PDs make the application process easier for IR applicants. Please note that this panel features real-time audience participation through slido.com. The website and access code are displayed here and then at the bottom of the screen for the remainder of the presentation. So throughout the webinar, you may submit your questions or vote on an existing question at this website. We will try our best to address the popular questions which are relevant to the webinar. While that's going on, I will highlight the outline of our webinar. Uh, given the breadth of our content, this event will be split up into two parts. Part one consists of the pre-application process, which is geared towards students of all levels with an emphasis on upperclassmen. Part two will then focus on the application process itself in the setting of COVID-19 pandemic. So for part one, we will start with panelist introductions and then discuss various aspects of a medical student's experiences that lead up to residency applications. With whatever time left, we will field questions from slido.com. As most of our audience has probably heard earlier last month, multiple national organizations, including the ACGME and AMC came together to form a work group to address the current residency cycle and ongoing pandemic. The Coalition for Physician Accountability's work group specified guidelines regarding away rotations, virtual interviews and residency timelines. The APDR and APDIR formed a joint letter agreeing with these recommendations with the statement that's shown above. So throughout this webinar, our panelists will begin to address common concerns related to these unprecedented guidelines, amongst other applica application related topics. That being said, please note that regarding the content of tonight's webinar, I'd like to offer a brief but important statement. Uh, as APDIR and APDR are working to provide resources and potentially make recommendations for IRDR program directors, at this time, the only official guidelines provided by them uh, was cited in the previous slide. So that being said, uh, tonight's panelists will be speaking on behalf of their own local programs and respective plans, not the future plans of the APDR slash APDIR. So please bear in mind that as these circumstances are constantly changing during this unprecedented cycle, the guidance from tonight's webinar is meant to offer some direction with what we know thus far. Uh, it is a privilege to introduce our esteemed panel members. We thank you all dearly for taking the time to answer our questions tonight as we transition back to our cl clinical curricula. If the panelists would be so kind as to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves. So your name, the name of your institution, and something you'd like to share about yourself, your program, or why you like IR so much. Um, Dr. Bream, would you mind starting us off? Yes. Uh... So first of all, I just want to 
uh, thank everybody for inviting me to this uh, amazing uh, time and amazing uh, webinar. And um, my name is Peter Bream. I am a uh, interventional radiologist and I currently am the Diagnostic Radiology Program Director at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I was a previous uh, IR Program Director for many years uh, for the fellowship and then started the IR Integrated Residency and Independent Residency at Vanderbilt. Um, about a year and a half ago, I moved back to my uh, medical school institution at UNC and uh, became the uh, DR Program Director. Um, being uh, an interventional radiologist, I, I think that we're going to probably touch on this in the theme a little bit later, but uh, I think it's very, very important that we do not forget our diagnostic radiology roots. Um, I actually am a third generation radiologist, and uh, my grandfather and my father were both radiologists, so I've grown up in this world. Um, it has been just amazing over the last 20 years to see how our specialty has changed. And now that we have the IR residency and primary specialty, I think it's just um, the really the beginning of our specialty. I think we have many, many years ahead for growth. Um, and I'm just very excited to be here. Uh, I'd love to share some of my experiences and um, uh, hope that we get some good participation and questions from this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bream. Uh, Dr. Dickey. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to uh, participate in this webinar. Uh, I'm, my name is Kevin Dickey. I'm a uh, the uh, integrated program, uh, integrated IR program director with Forrest and chief of interventional radiology. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I've uh, been both in academic and private practice, and have practiced both diagnostic and interventional radiology. Uh, and I certainly echo uh, what uh, Dr. Bream has said about our radiology roots. What will make us great as interventional radiologists is how we uh, incorporate uh, our expertise in imaging and how we apply it to clinical medicine. And so um, uh, I've certainly through the years, and I was a program director for a fellowship uh, back in uh, Connecticut and uh, at other times, uh, one of the things that we always wanted to make sure of is that uh, whoever is interested in interventional radiology also develops and has an interest in diagnostic radiology. You don't want to have residents that are only using diagnostic radi radiology as an end, as a means to get to the, uh, to the interventional radiology uh, practice. So I would recommend, and as we go through and look at, uh, look at all this and give you advice, uh, and to quote uh, Peter Bream and my, my uh, good friend, Mike Miller, uh, we want you to be the best damn diagnostic radiology resident in the program if you're in the integrated uh, IR residency. So uh, in any case, um, looking forward to uh, giving advice and, uh, and learning from you all as to what you all expect as well in your program. Thank you so much, Dr. Dickey. Uh, Dr. McLennan. Uh, thanks, Rand, for the introduction and, and the invitation. Um, so I, I'm the uh, program director for the programs at the Cleveland Clinic um, in Cleveland, Ohio. And our program is somewhat unique in that it really draws upon the experience and fundings of two institutions within the city and it actually crosses the state lines. Um, we use the Cleveland Clinic Western Florida campus uh, regularly and just received a, a philanthropic gift to fund a position down there for the entire period of the year. So starting in July, we will have residents that rotate through Cleveland Clinic Maine um, Metro Health System and the Cleveland Clinic Florida, as well as some of the regional hospitals, including the Akron General. Hospital. So there's two level one trauma centers built into the program. There's a neurointerventional piece that's built into the program. And there's a, a pretty wide array of collaborative vascular work down in Florida that really helped us round out the whole program. So for the last seven, eight years, as I've put together the fellowship and put together the residency, I've been striving towards creating the maximum variation in clinical experience for any of the trainees that come through the program, because in that way, I think you get the broadest scope in your education. 
Um, so we think it's very important that you learn how to do some vascular work, um, even though our main campus, we don't do a lot of it, um, and that you learn how to do some of the neurovascular interventions that general interventional radiologists need to know how to do, things like stroke and carotid stents and some of the extracranial embolizations, and that you know how to do all of the things that most of us are really good at, at teaching you, which is all the stuff related to cancer and the other interventions. Um, we also have a very active PE program, and with 20 interventional radiologists at the main campus, our problem is generally we have too many things for you to choose to learn from, and you can't be everywhere at once. So that's really the lament of my previous fellows, and will probably be the lament of all of the residents who come through our program. So happy to help tonight. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Oh, we really appreciate that. And Dr. Mastelani. Hi, good evening, guys, and uh, thanks, uh, Ryan, and uh, greetings to my fellow uh, co-panelists, a distinguished group. I don't know how I managed to get on it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the program director for the IR uh, residencies at Emory University. I've been at Emory a little over a year and was previously the uh, fellowship program director um, at the University of Michigan for the preceding five years. And uh, Emory's uh, an interesting uh, place in the sense that we um, cover five uh, hospitals in Metro Atlanta. Um, and each hospital is, is distinct in what it offers. Um, you have everything from the major inner city uh, trauma center, thousand plus bed hospital uh, in Grady, um, which is the largest stroke center, uh, highest volume in the world, um, as well as a level one trauma for 100 plus mile radius, to an ivory tower university program with a, one of the highest volumes of liver transplant and uh, IO interventions, to um, um, uh, more of a historical private practice uh, parochial uh, um, hospital at St. Joseph's that does uh, essentially the full breadth of intervention um, to boutique hospitals at Johns Creek, um, which allow us to do advanced pain uh, IR uh, with uh, Dr. Pologo. So when we look at uh, the breadth of what we offer at each campus, we feel like it provides a well-rounded experience. My my particular love in IR is hepatobiliary and uh, a lymphatic slash uh, venous interventions. And um, that's something that I practice in very high volume. And I was really drawn to the uh, Atlanta area to both build the training program um, beyond its size. Um, to put it in perspective, we have 30 attendings in our practice. Uh, we just hired six more. And um, we, we have a fairly large uh, residency as well. And it matches up with the size of the um, program and the patient population to, I think, provide a uh, really good, well-rounded experience. So happy to be a part of this and um, answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mashalani. Um, and we'll proceed to the next slide where we will start discussing the first topic, which is uh, why IR is a specialty of interest. So uh, through uh, the next few slides where I'll be asking these questions, panelists are welcome to answer whichever ones they feel are most compelling. Um, and we can, if possible, keep answers uh, to two minutes um, per panelist uh, so we can make it through uh, the first half. Um, I'll begin with, if you were to share one thing with medical students about IR, what would it be? What are the most compelling reasons applicants say they are interested in IR? And are there any red flags or concerning reasons for an applicant pursuing IR training? Uh, Dr. Breen, would you mind starting us off again? Absolutely. Uh, so IR is really the best marriage of uh, advanced imaging, um, meaning DR, and uh, advanced patient care. Uh, being an IR is being able to treat patients using minimally invasive techniques uh, to be creative. Uh, and to solve problems that no one else can solve. Uh, I can only, I can sum this up best in a quote that I recently saw on Twitter. Uh, there is a, I don't know how many of you guys uh, follow this guy, but there's a, um, I think he's an ophthalmologist. His, <laughs> he's got a really funny handle. It's like Dr. Glockham Fulken or something. And he, uh, he said it best. He said, being an IR, one cannot call oneself an IR until they have put a catheter into a vessel that no one knows the name of, using a device that no one has seen to treat a disease that no one has heard of. And I can I, I can put that the best. I mean, that's that's absolutely what the pinnacle of IR is. And um, 
I was talking to one of my residents today. We were going over some anatomy on uh, one of the CT scans. And uh, I just told her, I said, you know, the best part of my job is that I probably learn something new, uh, create something new, figure out a way to solve a problem new every week. And I've been doing that for 20 years now. And I, uh, I can truly say that uh, uh, it's, it's just so fulfilling to be able to do that. So that's what I think about IR. Thank you, Dr. Breen. Dr. Dickey? You know, one of the things that, uh, that I would say that is, is, is uh, fascinated me throughout my career is that, first of all, it's a relatively new specialty, interventional radiology. It's full of innovators and it needs more. It, there is plenty of chance to innovate and to think about problems and, and design devices or techniques that, uh, that you know, nobody has ever done or heard of or, or you know, make a better mousetrap. There is, there, is all, there is plenty of opportunity to do this, and it's always fascinating to me that in, in, and, in, and in being in a university setting, being around people that are always thinking of these kinds of, uh, these kinds of problems. Um, my one of my favorite, one of my favorite things, we're, we're, very, we're very closely uh, uh, collaborating with our, uh, what's called Wake Forest Innovations, which is um, you know, a group that we have that uh, helps design and patent and pitch devices. And when we sit down and we have we have meetings with them every uh, every week, and and a medical student or a resident will come by and say, you know, I've been thinking about this, but I'm sure it's already been thought of. And the head engineer who meets with us says, uh, actually, no, they haven't thought of that. And tell me more about that idea for that device. And that's exactly that's exactly how it goes. Uh, so if you really if you want to be in a in a specialty where we can't wait for you to come and make your mark and, and innovate. This is it. Um, there's none of the, there's none of the, the kind of uh, hierarchy that you might see in other specialties that feel themselves more established. Uh, we, we are, you know, and, and with the new training program, we have a group of people that are coming in that are going to demand the opportunity to make their mark. And we can't wait. So, um, so anyway, uh, that's how I feel about IR, and and I I you know I, I can tell you I've been doing this for a long time, and I love I have never not loved a day going to work except maybe when I had too much administrative stuff to do, but um, but it's it's I always love going to work uh, because some I'm going to see something new every day and learn every day. Thanks so much, Dr. Dickey. Um, Dr. McLennan. So, you know, I would advise medical students who are considering IR to, to really, um, you know, think about what it is that we do. And, and, and as you heard Peter and, and Kevin um, talk about it, is we're, we are a fairly vibrant um, and changing specialty. We, we will modify ourselves regularly over the course of the next several decades. In fact, I think it's been stated that we probably come up with two or three new procedures every two or three years. And so the target's always moving in what we do. So if you're interested in that kind of a dynamic, um, there really isn't a better specialty than, than IR. Um, but remember, you, you need to really love what it is that you're gonna choose to do. So, um, you know, if you've got in mind um, that you want to do something that's a little more static, or if you've got in mind that you want to be much more of a, you know, clinical or much more, you know, into the certain major surgical aspects, there are other specialties that will do that stuff. They just will not have the dynamic changes that we in IR will have. I will tell you that, that the way this residency is going to transform this specialty is the interventional radiologists will be consulting services all over the hospital. And so that consulting service aspect of your experience in third year medical school is gonna be, those are gonna be skills will be very important in an IR residency because it, it will take you to the point where you will be everybody's helper. 
and you'll become central to their the care of their patients and you'll really make a big difference in people's lives because you'll be doing things in a much less invasive way um, than the alternatives are. Um, and if that appeals to you, then I think IR is probably a pretty good fit for you. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Dr. Mishakalani. Um, I think one of the, you know, in in my relatively, you know, less than 10 year experience or just around 10 years, it's pretty amazing when I reflect back <clears throat> into what it was we were doing even when I was a resident versus what we're doing now and how dynamic the evolution of our field is. And I think um, as, as Dr. McClellan just said, you know, that constant rate of change seems to be accelerating. I mean, uh, 10 years ago or so, we weren't talking about prostate artery embolization and men's health, which is kind of mainstream, no pun intended, or bariatric IR. You know, arthritis and MSK interventions are, are growing rapidly. Um, never mind the applications of interventional oncology, uh, the basic science research associated with that, et cetera. You can only imagine what 10 more years um, from now will be. And if you're a med student, by the time you finish, um, what we're uh, potentially talking about whether it's uh, stents and, and filters that are self-absorbing or um, who knows what else may be coming down the pipe. Along that line, I mean, some of the other changes that I think are really in vogue now, uh, parallel what's happened with Rad Aid and the international outreach, as Dr. Dickey said, the innovation, uh, we have a whole innovation pathway where we're partnered with Georgia Tech and you know, we're looking at engineering students and patents and devices. And to me, it's really exciting because there's almost like a flavor for every single person who wants to go into IR. So, you know, on top of the clinical uh, applications um, of, of what an interventionist can do and this rapidly increasing breadth of procedures uh, and, and, and reach, uh, to me, it's just such an exciting field. And I think that's what really compelled me um, when I was a med student, you know, uh, being exposed to initially at the time, what really captivated me was TIPS and hepatobiliary interventions. And uh, by the time I made it to residency and fellowship, I fell in love with lymphatic intervention. And, you know, now I'm really starting to really enjoy pain intervention. And uh, along that line, it just um, is this constant change. And um, that, that to me just it keeps things exciting. And uh, I'd say that's really what I love um, about what we do. Thank you all for those insightful comments. Um, from my experience talking with aspiring IR and DRs, uh, the innovation and plasticity within IR, as you all have mentioned, always seems to be what draws us, to the students, to this relatively young field. Um, next, uh, here are some questions uh, geared towards choosing IR as a specialty. So within the ongoing pandemic, how should students determine if IR is right for them? Should the current circumstances and unknowns impact a student's decision to pursue IR in 2021. From uh, limited clinical experiences to a disrupted residency cycle, many students are worried about the current circumstances and the medical training climate they face this upcoming year. Do you have any words of wisdom from uh, the plan panelists regarding these current conditions and the consequential impact on medical schools? And Dr. Breen, we're back to you. You know, you have to turn the microphone on or y'all can't hear me. Um, I already like gave my answer, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I think that the, the yes, the pandemic has affected many, many aspects of life. Um, my experience has been that the pandemic really has not affected IR, uh, it, except that um, we, it, I mean, the pandemic should not affect your decision to go into IR, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, our practice has not changed very much. Uh, in fact, dialysis uh, interventions continue to be very, very important um, during all of this. Uh, the, all of the, um, uh, the hypercoagulability that we've seen with uh, COVID has uh, ramped up our DVT practice. Um, so I, th I think that really, to be honest with you, the, the pandemic really shouldn't affect your decision to go into IR. If anything, um, it should allow you to understand that you can do these procedures safely, 
Uh, I've done many procedures on COVID positive patients uh, with full PPE um, and, uh, and have uh, seen, you know, initially our uh, numbers dipped when uh, we decided to get rid of um, uh, elective procedures. But as we've been bringing those back just in the past week, we're, we're about 80 to 90 percent of pre-COVID numbers uh, since we've started to bring back the, the, the uh, elective procedures. Um, so I really don't think it should, the, the current circumstances really should not hinder somebody from going into IR at all. I think there's, um, there's actually a, a position for us to be a leader in treating COVID positive patients. Um, I know that at our institution, um, we, have, we have yet to see a surge at UNC. Um, they are actually predicting our surge to come in September based on the, the way that we have flattened our curve. Um, but we signed up to uh, do all of the usual hospitalist procedures, the uh, central lines, the paracentesis, the thoracentesis, uh, because we knew that our medicine colleagues would be manning ventilators and uh, dealing with very sick COVID patients. Um, and we were more than, more than able and more than ready to step right in and do LPs and central lines and thoracentesis and paracentesis um, on these patients that normally would be done by uh, either um, nurse APPs or by the, um, uh, the hospital service. So, um, uh, so I, I'll shut up right there, but I, 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 I really don't see a huge impact um, to, dis, to dissuade somebody uh, that IR is right for you for the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Breen. Dr. Dickey, anything to add? I uh, know that's uh, that was a that was a, a great uh, discourse, Peter. I, I would say that if anything, uh, the COVID pandemic has has shown has shown uh, at least in our institution how valuable we are in IR. When other when other uh, when other um, services such as the surgery service um, and others uh, really kind of dwindled down to nothing, uh, we were busy we, we we never got below 80 percent of what we of our of our capacity and um and that's because you know purely elective procedures in ir are relatively limited i mean you really can't stop cancer you you got to tr keep treating those patients you got to keep treating the traumas and the infections uh and all and so we really we really didn't we really didn't dial it uh, we didn't see a, a huge dip uh so as I say, if anything, um, we, uh, we, we, we've seen this almost as an opportunity with, uh, with, uh, with, our, with, the, with, the, with the COVID population in a sense uh, to uh, show what, we, what, our, what our abilities are and how we can help. Um, and so, and that's not only in, in, in the, uh, what we call the essential services like a paras, parasynthesis and thoracentesis, it's, it's, it's lots of others. I think the thing that we also have noticed and have to be careful of is making sure that um, uh, if other services are supposed to be doing something uh, and they don't want to do it because they're worried about uh, COVID positivity, that we have the clinical, uh, you know, clinical chutzpah and uh, and uh, cloud to say, no, I don't know, you know, I think you need to be doing this, uh, uh, and not just do, not just have us do it because you, you're you're afraid. Um, and so we, I think, in, in a sense, at least indirectly, we've gained even more um, respect from our other clinical colleagues. So. Uh, as far as the um, as far as the you know kind of the other other issues of training um, and uh, whether or not uh, trainees are involved in COVID cases, there are some some institutions that say they don't want you know they're trying to protect their trainees from from seeing COVID positive patients. We give we give our trainees the option uh, whether they want to be involved or not. Um, so far, we've treated several COVID positive patients, uh, and we as, an, we as a service have not seen anyone convert. Uh, all, you know, we've had a couple of, couple of cases amongst our staff, and those were all from, from community acquired. Um, 
or travel related uh, uh, COVID uh, spread. So in any case, don't, and it, the, the bottom line is that no, don't, uh, don't let this, don't let this uh, dissuade you. Thank you, Dr. Dickey. Dr. McLennan, anything to add on this topic? So I'll, I'll address some of the issues that, you know, what does this pandemic do for your sort of selection process and, and, and the approach it. And, and, and the thing is that you at your age are far better equipped to deal with this kind of change than somebody at my age. And that's because you guys are living in the digital world. Um, so, you know, your first question is how do you determine if, if IR is right for you? You know, you've got y YouTube, man. You know, there are hundreds of videos out there. Some of them are didactic lectures, like from UCLA. There are some really short, nice vignettes about the kinds of things. Get. So if you're searching for something, you don't have ready access to an IR practice in your medical school for some reason. Um, you can look at what there is online to sort of determine, you know, whether that's the right thing for you. Um, the other thing is be prepared. Um, you're going to interview digitally this this uh, this fall. You're going to be getting on uh, Zoom conference calls. And, you know, we just had our folks sort of educate us on how to put the the um, the Zoom, the multiple Zoom systems in place where you'll end up on a call with uh, 10 or 15 other applicants in a, in, a, in a sort of waiting room that you'll go out for 20 minute interviews with one individual faculty. Don't be afraid of that. Those, those are great opportunities for, for both showcasing how awesome you are and, and learning about um, you know, the programs in, in very great depth because when you've got dedicated 20 minutes you know, one on one with a camera and a computer, you know, it's all business for that 20 minutes. The amount of work that gets done on a Zoom call is probably incrementally higher than the amount of work that gets done in an in-person meeting. So um, just, you know, embrace the technology that you're going to be forced to use. These are things that may well get used after COVID is no longer an issue because it may offer some opportunities for efficiencies in certain ways. So embrace it. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be moving on to the next slide, which discusses uh, more specific items relating to assessing applicants. And thank you all for the invite, invaluable insight there. Uh, it brings me comfort to know that we're all in this together and the IR is thriving uh, through this hard time. Um, so this slide will cover how you as PDs assess IR candidates from the 2018 uh, charting outcomes in the MASH data set. Table one shows some common metrics for applicants who matched IR versus those who did not during that application cycle. Dr. Mantelani, uh, would you mind starting us off on this slide? Uh, from the preclinical years and third year clerkships, what measures do you use to select students for interviews and match ranking? What advice would you give to a student interested in IR who is disappointed in any of those metrics? And do you have any additional advice for preclinical students interested in IR? What first steps should they take? Thank you. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think the first thing, you know, when I look at this table, it highlights something that um, to me is really important. You know, um, in the not too distant future, step one is going away from a numerical score. And if you look at the people who are matched versus unmatched, you know, you're seeing a four point difference between the numerical score on step one and seven on step two. And I think this highlights something to me that, um, frankly, I don't pay much attention to scores. You know, what I really want to see are, are two things. One is a consistent um, work ethic throughout med school. That's not to say that preclinical years don't matter because I think they do. If I see somebody who's just kind of cruising and never really applied themselves, it makes me wonder, you know, when they're a resident, are they going to apply themselves? Because I believe completely in the Kevin Dickey uh, and uh, Mike Miller model, which is I expect my IR residents to be the best DR residents as well. So I want to see this passion uh, for excellence and this passion for IR uh, more so more than I want to see a 270. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, numbers are numbers. I want someone to be able to pass standardized exams because unfortunately for the present present period of time, that is how people move through um, getting board certified, et cetera. And ultimately, we all want our trainees to succeed and become board certified. So to me, that's how far um, I regard um, standardized exams. 
uh, and I just want to see a consistent um, pattern across the whole application of hard work, um, making opportunities when opportunities may not exist. So someone who can kind of, um, you know, be that hidden gem of um, excellence and, and getting things done, even if the uh, opportunity isn't there. Uh, those are the things I really look for. Um, somebody who's uh, worked for what they have and um, has accomplished a lot, even when they haven't been given a lot. To me, I think that's really important. Thanks so much, Dr. Mashalani. It's a, a, good, a great perspective to hear, um, especially amidst all the numbers that we can get caught up in. Um, and Dr. McLennan. Uh, so so I, I agree entirely, and, and, I'll, and I'll give you what I do just so that it gives you a sense of what's what one way a, a program director approaches it is I take anything that might have a numerical score of some kind and I simplify it as much as I can into like three point scales. So all of the exams that you take are on a three point scale in our system. And I have probably 10 or 15 different people reviewing applications before the process begins. And that's just one of the criteria that I have them look at. I look at, you know, are they, is there some connection to our location, our place, um, you know, and a variety of other things that have to do with, uh, you know, your clerkships, good letters, your personal statement, is there anything interesting there? Um, and we're really trying to get a picture of who you are. And then what I do with all these scores, since I have so many people scoring everybody, and I have a lot of duplicates, is I actually um, mean test them for themselves. So if somebody scores harder than another, they they, they tend to um, to be averaged out um, uh, in the process. And then I try to define what a one and two and a three is. And I think that way I'm able to get out of 250 applications, I can get about half of them sort of screened as people who are competitive. And then we just sort of go down uh, a list and then as a collective, try to figure it out. And I spend a lot of time trying to ensure diversity in the class. Um, and, and, and making sure I have women and I have people with very diverse backgrounds um, in the applicant pool that's going to get interviewed. Um, and I try to really focus on, on making sure that, that the class that I get is going to be as diverse and well represented as possible. Um, and, and so it's a gestalt. Uh, and I, I pick a class that's about 10 times the size of the number that I want to fill. Um, and I interview that many, and I interview them in big batches. And with uh, online interviews, it's going to be similar. So I would say, yeah, a number is just a number. Make sure that your application shows how three-dimensional you really are. Because if we can see the real you in, your, in the paper, that's what's going to attract us um, uh, to your application over something that looks very bland and vanilla. Because um, that you can get very lost in them, and, and it's and it, you know if you're reading hundreds of these things, it can get very very daunting. Which is one of the reasons I try to limit my faculty to review only 20 at a time, because it, it, then at least they can concentrate on them. Now, Ryan, if I could just add one thing, I think one of your earlier slides had um, like what is the like red flags for like an applicant, and I'm going I I'm reminded by something that you know in our one of our meetings, you know, we were talking about the different applicants. And we had this person who had a stellar uh, medical school record with like a perfect honors and had like two 70s on their um, steps. And we were all like, wow, this person on paper looks great, but you talk to them. And, you know, I asked him, said, you know, you've accomplished a lot. What are you most, you know, what are you most proud of? Uh, and what do you do outside of med school? And it was like, I'm most proud of my academic record and outside of school, I like to study. And it's like, you know, you, you know, I think Gordon hit the nail on the head when he said, we want that three dimensional person who has outside interests and outside, um, outside activities um, and is also accomplished. But being, having one without the other doesn't necessarily compensate. Thank you, Dr. Ristolani. That was uh, really helpful addressing that red flags question. Um, I see somebody pointed that on slido.com, and we'll try our best to address a lot of those uh, questions as we have included them in the slides. Um, so uh, we'll try our best to move swiftly through all these topics because 
because there's such a wide breadth of material. Um, but I, from what I've read on slido.com, we do have a lot of these questions pointed out here in the webinar. Uh, next, we'll discuss away rotations, the big question that's on everybody's mind. Given that the work group guidelines discouraged away rotations nationally and that many institutions have their own policies to discourage these rotations, how would you advise students about away rotations? For students that meet the exception criteria, what would you recommend to them regarding away programs? Uh, Dr. McLennan, if you wouldn't mind starting us off again. So our, our institution is actually pretty restrictive on all of it. They, they don't even let our own students go away. So, um, and so what, 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 what you're facing here is a domino effect of the fact that for a month or so, medical students were not allowed into the hospitals from a safety perspective. And many institutions did this. And so what ended up happening is a truncation of the third year um, at clinical experience, you know, the core um, rotations got shortened. Many of them were turned into digital online didactic education to be followed by clinical education, and it changed the whole structure of the fall. So whereas before you were able to go on two or three away rotations in order to demonstrate how cool you were to a program that you might want to apply to, you're not going to have that opportunity anymore. You may be able to go to one, yeah, probably are not going to go to many at all before the application has to go in. So you're going to have to figure out um, ways of making your application look stronger based upon the experiences that you actually do have. Um, I have a couple people who tried to do summer work with us and wanted to do an online summer project. It just, that often doesn't work with, with the kind of work that I do. But if you have the ability to work on a clinical project with somebody who's an interventional radiologist and get that produced into an abstract or, and a paper or submitted it as a manuscript, those are things that um, you may well talk about as showing the extra work that you're doing. Uh, individual projects which reach out to your local community may be things that, that, I, would, that I would concentrate on. Use the resources you have close at hand to make yourself the best applicant possible um, and highlight that in your, in your application. And you may even want to address the issue of, because of this COVID experience, I was not able to go to your institution to show you one-on-one -on -one what kind of a work ethic I have, but here are some of the demonstrations that I have for you of, of how I'm really serious about learning interventional radiology. I'm really serious about becoming an interventional radiologist. And these are the kinds of, of projects I have been working on in my own institution where we have these limited resources. That those are the kinds of things that, that might help you in, your, in putting your application together. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Uh, Dr. Dickey. Anything to add on away rotations and uh, the work group guidelines? Well, I would say that Gordon, Gordon, I think uh, alluded to something that one of the to kind of a, a qualifier for how we look at candidates. You know, as you might imagine, and I, maybe I'm speaking to the wrong group in saying this, but you know, we see a lot of great applications and people have done lots of things. But if we see people that are actually have actually been self-starting and actually created something rather than just latching on to, to a, a project, um, that means a lot. Especially, you know, uh, I mean, having having not been a very good test taker myself, um, I, uh, you know, you have to kind of, you know, you, you the, I, I would say that IR is one specialty, at least where I, where I, where I've been involved that does take into account lots of other things other than test scores. Um, and, and, but probably the, the delimiter in all of this is, is, at least for us, is to see somebody that's actually, you know, maybe is in a place that doesn't have lots of opportunity and has created those opportunities. And that really is something that kind of sets one apart. Uh, the other, the other is actually having other interests uh, other than studying, as you would say. Uh, uh, that they've innovated in other ways. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't want to go on and on because I would love to have, have some more uh, Q&A from the, from the, the uh, participants. Thank you, Dr. Dickey. I think those are some, some great suggestions on your parts. Um, 
I think it brings brings a nice diversity to to the new class of applicants. Um, I will uh, skip over the next slide on away rotations as it might be uh, less important than other subjects just based off of the Q&A on slido.com. Um, however, for the next uh, panelists, Dr. Breen and Dr. Mashalani, feel free to address any of these questions. So if your program has plans for virtual ways or anything of that nature, um, I will move on to this set of questions here. So this figure here shows data collected from 15 IR program directors in 2018. It lists the factors that they found most important when ranking applicants. Many of these factors rely on applicants building rapport with members of the program. And a question that is on a lot of med students' minds right now is, without these away rotations, now what? How will the absence of away rotations impact uh, your evaluation of student performance and student commitment to the specialty? How do you think the lack of aways will impact the following? Applicants getting to know the residency programs, and then the other way around, program directors getting to learn about the applicants. Dr. Breen? Yeah, this is really, um, uh, th this is actually the crux of the problem, right? Um, we have for years uh, put a lot of weight onto the interview and to how people act during their interview. Um, it is amazing to me how amazing candidates can look on paper uh, and then they show up and you're like, wow. Um, and then vice versa, um, people that you invite that you have no idea and they just blow the interview away. Um, so the first thing, applicants getting to know the residency programs. Uh, I can tell you as a program director, I have scrambled um, my residents and I have charged them with creating a fun interactive video um, which will take place of our tour that we usually do of our institution. Um, in exploring this in the committee meetings we have discovered that we actually can maybe make this more um, uh, valuable to the resident because we can include people that may not have been there the day that you toured. We can um, do set interviews. We can, um, you know, really show our residency for what it is. There's a backside of that, which is I'm not going to show you the trash that's hanging out in the corner of the of the reading room. I'm not going to show you how, um, you know, how smelly our uh, our reading rooms can be, or the fact that we have a locker room for the residents that is like disgusting. Um, you're not going to see that stuff. So um, that's the first thing is to try and come up with a way that I can virtually show you my residency in the best light. Um, I think that that's an easy thing. I think that we can totally do this. Um, just to give you an idea of what we have decided to do at UNC, which is that um, we did 10 interview days last year. During those 10 interview days, we spent over $1,000 a day on food, um, swag, uh, all sorts of stuff. That means that this year we have a $10,000 budget to create the slickest video you've ever seen. Um, so we're, we're starting with that and uh, we're running with it. So hopefully you'll get to know our residency really well because we're going to throw all of our uh, resources into that. The other one is gonna be really hard, um, us getting to know about you. I think when we do our residency, um, uh, uh, when we do our residency interviews, probably the best part of our interview is at the end of the day, after you've done your interviews, after you've done the tour, after you've seen everything, we have you sit in the conference room and we invite various residents to come and have lunch with you. And it's amazing to see how the interactions just start, you know, they just spur up. And we have attendings, we have residents, we have everybody just drop in and it's kind of a, a happy hour kind of thing in the middle of the day. Um, of course, all the residents come because it's free lunch. But um, other than that, uh, it is really a way for you um, to, to, to see the personality of the residency and for us to see the personality of the um, applicants. 
Uh, when I interview applicants, one of the first things I, I tell them is that, you know what, the fact that you're sitting in this chair means that you've checked all the boxes, you've done everything, um, and, uh, you know, we are, at this point, it's, it's a personality contest and to see if you like us and we like you. Um, the way rotations were a way to kind of do a pre-interview for that. Um, and, and I might be, you know, getting too far into the woods as far as the, um, the actual interview process. But um, uh, I, I think that uh, it's just, it's, it's a new world. And I think that you guys actually are a lot better uh, equipped to deal with this than we are. So I'll shut up at that point. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, Dr. Mushdalani. You know, the first thing I'll say is that um, just to remember that everybody's in the same boat in terms of the other applicants. I mean, nobody's really doing away rotations. We just started having our own students um, on rotation um, this month. So um, to a certain degree, it would not surprise me if people, you may see a small bump in people who end up staying at their same home programs. Perhaps, perhaps not. We'll see what happens. Um, in terms of you guys getting to see the program, what I would really uh, recommend you guys to do is uh, there's absolutely nothing illegal in you visiting the city um, and uh, seeing if you can meet up uh, with people um, to, to get an idea of the feel of the culture of the types of people there. Um, while you're not going to be on rotation for a month, it gives you a, a, a real um, flavor for what it might have been like. You know, we can all give you statistics on the number of procedures and um, all the other different things that you'll see and where you'll rotate and weeks of call and other sort of stuff. Frankly, at the end of the day, I find most of this stuff to really not matter. It's really the, the, the experience that you have, or the network that you develop, um, and I think those things really guide your career more than anything else. Um, so, you know, getting to know programs is going to be more challenging for you without a doubt, it's gonna be different um, and maybe more challenging during this adjustment period as it becomes more different. There are different ways, you know, programs can try to give you the information, um, but some of it's also gonna be inevitably, I know you guys also rely on word of mouth and Aunt Minnie and all these other things. Um, reach out to the people who are ahead of you, find out a little bit about programs, but also do your own digging, um, knowing that some of the information you should take with a grain of salt. In regards to how <laughs> we'll get we'll get to learn about the applicants. Um, I can tell you, don't be surprised, for years and years, I will just cold call you guys sometimes. And I used to have coffee with people at SIR and um, wherever all the time. Um, and if somebody's driving through Atlanta and they want to have coffee, I probably would still have coffee with them at, at a socially distanced appropriate uh, mm -hmm. place. So um, I think things are more challenging and it take a little bit more legwork but I think the potential is still there. Um, and, you know, we'll see how this, it's as big a change for us as it is for you um, and probably creates stress on both sides, but in, inevitably we're going to get through it and I think it's going to be just fine. Thank you, Dr. Mishalani. Um The next slide will also be a little bit about away rotations. And based off the questions on slido.com, students seem to be most interested in uh, these last two questions. What elements of the application will you take into greater consideration, whether it's grades, extracurriculars, societal involvement, and uh, students may rely on away rotations to overcome aspects of their application through uh, what other means can students overcome those potential weaknesses? So uh, some of the weaknesses that were noted online, many people have mentioned step scores. I know we've addressed that. Um, research was mentioned, leadership, uh, clerkship grades, and uh, one very popular question has been uh, for those who want to match outside of the region, if they're on West Coast, uh, but they're waiting to train in the East Coast, how are they supposed to show interest without away rotations? And Dr. Mustalani again. You know, um, I, I think uh, the way I approach the application initially isn't really going to change. Um, I. I you know, I know the word holistic is thrown out a lot, but I do try to take a holistic uh, approach. Uh, and believe it or not, before I interview anybody, um, I actually usually call some of your letter writers or somebody at your program that I know. So I've always um, had that approach 
uh, before. And I like to do my homework on the people who are applying because um, to me, I think it makes A, the interview um, higher yield for both of us and it gets me a window into who you are. In regards to overcoming aspects of the application where you may feel um, weak, um, again, uh, if you have a relative weakness in one area, uh, one isolated area alone is not going to disqualify you from an interview or otherwise. You know, you're still going to get your foot in the door and you're going to still get a chance. So it's really about making the rest of your application as um, strong as possible, really communicating your interest to a particular program. Um, you know, and it's a fine line between saying, hey, I'm really interested and I'd love to go there and, and badgering somebody on a daily or weekly basis and um, finding people who can be your advocates. Um, you know, if, if you were at UNC and you really wanted to come to Emory, have somebody call me, just not Peter Breen, um, to advocate for you. And uh, I say that in, in jest because... Absolute, uh, absolutely not. Do not have a call about you. <laughs> because, you know, and, and Peter can attest to it that I called him about the applicants um, who, who he wrote letters for uh, this hey, past Bill, year. You're giving, Bill, you're giving away all of our secrets. So you need to be quiet. <laughs> oh, I'm giving away your secrets, not my secrets. And, uh, but, I mean, you know, have that person who, you know, I have a rapport with over years um, be your advocate. And I think to me that really speaks a lot. And, and I will say one last thing in regards to away rotations. They're a double-edged sword. Because you do an away rotation, and let's say you don't perform well, you know that also doesn't necessarily reflect well on you. Um, so just take that with, well, you know, people assume, oh, I'm going to do away rotation. It's going to totally secure my position in this residency. Well, not everybody does so well or does as well as they think on the away rotations. Just throwing that out there. Thank you, Dr. Mishlani. Um Dr. McLennan. So the only thing I would I would add is I, I'd go back to the idea that, that I threw out there before. So we want to see your three-dimensional self. Um, so, you know, this goes back to when you had to write a college essay and, and differentiate yourself from 200,000 other applicants to the major universities you applied to. Um, you want to you wanna tell us who you are. Um, and, and if you're personal statement becomes very, very important in that case, because it really should tell us who you are. Um, and it it's one of the things that I think is going to make a bigger difference in this review of the application piece is, is that personal statement. Um, the letters are almost all good. You, it's really hard to tell the difference between the letters. In some people's letters, it's, it, it, they have code words they use, which makes it easier. Um, but it, it for the most part, letters don't differentiate. Um, if it's a letter from somebody I know, that's important. Now, the other thing is, if you are at a place, like, you know, I'll give you the example. If you're a case and you do not have a letter from Preet Kang, that's a red flag. Because Preet does the vast majority of the PAD, you know, kind of training there and, and it's changing at that university now that the IR department's getting much more robust and 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 it's there's much more going on at the university than there was before but making sure that you've got a letter from the one IR in your program that people will know becomes really important um, because what what often gets asked is well there's not a letter from pre where did they focus their IR experience? And, and you know, people ask that question, and, um, and that can sometimes um, review, you know, make their review of their application a little bit weaker. Um, so make sure you get the, the people that are noteworthy in your program to actually write letters for you. And the only way somebody's going to be able to write a decent letter for you is you actually, you actually talk, go and talk to them. Um, and now it will be on the phone or via a Zoom call. Um, and then, you know, there's no reason you can't try to reach out to a couple of people. Number one, be respectful of people's time. And, and number two, I would not reach out to 25 different people. You, if you're really focused on one particular place, uh, be, be honest in, in saying so, because what you don't want to end up doing is, is, you know, telling 25 people that, you know, you're my best boyfriend. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Um, we're going to move on to very briefly uh, USMLE step two. And uh, given the reduced capacity of testing centers and exam cancellations, in a line or two, how important is step two CK? Um, and for those students that are dissatisfied with their step one scores, should they prioritize step two? For students with strong step one scores, should they prioritize step two um, or should they just defer it till after ERAS? And will the absence of step two CK scores in ERAS impact interview invitations? Um, Dr. McLennan. I, I, I talked about this before. I don't, the only thing I want to know is can you take a test? Okay, so it's a three point scale. If you if you do reasonably well on some kind of an exam at some point in your life, then you'll get a three. So so no, I, it has it I, in my for my program test scores have. I'm trying to make them have as little impact as possible. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Dr. Dickey. Yeah, this is always a a, a, um, a question uh, amongst when I try to um, counsel the the students that we have at Wake that feel like they uh, didn't do well enough on uh, step one. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's no reason. I mean, it, it, the problem obviously is the issue of the step two scores this year. Um, um, I, you know, it's always nice to have a second chance in a sense. Um, but please keep in mind that I think probably IR is the is 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 one of the is one of the the specialties that is it really does try to look at the at the whole person the three dimensions um, you know all of the entire person and how they'll fit into our the culture where they're going to be training um, and so uh, you know that's that's I, I i would i would say that uh sure it's it's always good to try to try a little bit better if you can if it's if it's offered um uh, if you don't feel comfortable with what you what you got initially but it's not it's not a it's not a deal breaker uh if if you you know if you if you show dedication to um uh, you know being a true contributor to the specialty and to your training Thank you, Dr. Dickey. And our last slide before I take a couple questions from the audience that were uh, pretty important uh, is regarding clerkships, how students should make the best use of their time before applying now that there might be more free time potentially given the fact that away rotations are gone and that um, global away rotations uh, aren't a thing. So uh, what non-IR, DR clerkships, sub-I's, AI's, or otherwise should students consider taking before ERAS? Um, are some third-year clerkships uh, more important than others, or some fourth-year clerkships more important than others? And um, which of the following would uh, you like students to prioritize during this time uh, in terms of education, uh, the relevant clerkships and electives, uh, or virtual curricula? for leadership, um, should they get involved with local at the local level with symposia and IRIGs, at the national level, should they get involved with the MSC and then research volunteer opportunities or even hobbies? Dr. Dickey. Okay, that's a big one. Um, I would say that, um, I, and I certainly don't speak for all the panel, but I would say that probably one of the the uh, the special the uh, clerkships that that we look at most closely are, are the surgical and subspecialty surgical clerkships um, in the ICU clerkships, but no, but mostly those having to do with surgery because they're that's really kind of close to what we're doing in that kind of decision making process. Um, so. Um, uh, that's that's a, that's the short answer, and I know we probably should be giving short answers now that we're out of time. Um, as far as other other uh, you know leadership and educational uh, and other uh, activities, um, I would say that being involved in the in the in the national societies and and uh, being involved in, in, in at, at any level, whatever is interest interests you in either advocacy or education or research, is always good. Um, uh, and so that's, you know, I would, I would not 
I would not waste any time in trying to get involved, um, you know, at, with the SIR or even the ACR or the RSNA, uh, especially if you're interested uh, in advocacy. Um, so. Thank you, Dr. Dickey. Um, Dr. Breen. Yeah, um, so I would echo uh, what Kevin just said about um, the uh, third year clerkships. You know, and I'll go back to what Gordon was talking about, Dr. McLennan was talking about um, with the, uh, the, the letters and stuff. You know, I'm more interested in work ethic. Um, IR takes a lot of work and a lot of dedication. And if you do a third year clerkship with a pediatric rotation and you um, get to know one of the pediatric attendings and they can speak to your work ethic, to your, to your character, um, I will actually really take that over some named guy that you might have called up and said, hey, I'm from your institution, will you write me a letter uh, kind of thing. I, that we all get these letters uh, from uh, chairmen that happen to be IRs or something like that that are literally form letters. And I, I, I mean, I don't think you guys realize this because you want to get the name on there, but they're the same letter. They sent, they just, you know, substitute your name. So um, I, I think any clerkship that you do, obviously the, the surgical ones are more aligned with IR, but again, I take a much more holistic view to all of this um, this year. In particular, I'm looking at volunteer opportunities. I'm looking for people who are have um, strong um, community involvement. They um, uh, are involved with their local uh, food bank, things things like that. Because to me, that shows that you're selfless. And that's uh, you know, we all go into medicine with um, uh, you know being very selfless you know going into it in the first place but uh things like that are the types of things that um really uh separate you and and just as the last kind of thing i want to say is that, and i just I, I just got off a zoom call two days ago with uh, a prospective student who is um like many of you he's in a small institution that does not have irs he's freaking out because he can't go do any away lo uh, rotations and he is, just reached out to me and says, how can I make myself uh, attractive? And um, I really struggled with this because, uh, you know, people who do away rotations traditionally have had an uh, advantage. Um, but I think that your personal statement is going to be more important than ever this year. And your personal statement needs to, to mention some of these things that are going to separate you from um, the rest of the applications. And you just have to dig deep and come up with uh, your personality that, uh, that will shine. Um, so uh, that's what I would, uh, I would recommend. Obviously, you know, tons of research is great. Tons of leadership stuff is great, but not everybody can do everything. So um, pick, pick what makes you special uh, and highlight that. And, um, and hopefully that will uh, get you into the right place that you wanna go to. You know, there, there's a little bit of the elephant in the room that we should mention is, you know, one of the questions that you might wanna address is what did you do during this COVID crisis? And many medical students banded together to do certain things, even though they weren't allowed in the hospitals, but they, they, they provided other resources to their hospitals and they, and they were active in these kinds of volunteer activities that helped the hospital, the medical school and the institution address this crisis in whatever way they were capable of doing. And you, many of you will have done those types of activities. And I think, you know, thinking about what it was that you did and how you banded together with your fellow students and your and your and your educators is to, to create an environment that was safe and and moved the system forward through the crisis those are things that are worth addressing in your application great point gordon i think that's uh exactly what i was trying to get at thank you dr bream and uh, for our last slides any bonus advice um 
for do you have any additional advice for medical students prior to starting uh, the application process this is prior to applying uh, before october 2020 and dr breen wow um stay safe um be realistic with your mental health um understand what stress is all about um prioritize uh i love what gordon just said about get involved with your local area and do something about this pandemic um this pandemic has thrust healthcare workers that, that, that what you want to do for the rest of your life has thrust us into this hero mode I mean, dude, we're not heroes. We're just like everybody else. We just happen to care about patients and take care of patients. Um, so uh, my advice would be, um, you know, this is a great time to hide behind Netflix and to, um, you know, d learn how to knit or do something, you know, during all this downtime you've got. But I'm really going to be looking for the people who, went out in their community found a problem and and worked towards a solution uh so I, I think that this is the time to build your resume you've got time um one more youtube video about um placing a central line or doing something like that's not going to help you uh, but getting out there um marching for black lives matter um, uh, do the white coats for black lives, uh, you know, that sort of stuff, I think is really, really important these days. Um, we are faced with some really, really uh, unprecedented times, and this is an opportunity for you to show yourself that you can differentiate yourself from the crowd. Thank you, Dr. Bream. I think it's very important to take kind of the whole world context uh, into account here. So we really appreciate hearing that. Dr. Dickey? Well, I certainly echo what, uh, what both uh, Gordon and Peter have said. I think um, one of the things that uh, I'll, I will say it again, as I said at the very beginning, is that do what you can to say that you embrace all of radiology as well as interventional radiology um, in the context of the covid crisis uh, one of the things that that we have delineated defined ourselves in ir when there are and i'm not going to say where but there are certain this is certainly happening in in plenty of places in the country where radiologists are trying to do what they can to stay away from the hospital. Uh, we and I are, are going toward the hospital and trying to help these patients face to face uh, with appropriate PPE, of course. Um, but that's, that's, that's our breed. That's who we are. Um, and, and uh, you know, you need, you need, you know, if you're, if you're willing, you know, and you know, and, and able, and, and 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 think of yourself in that mindset, and that then 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 you should be doing what we do. Thank you so much, Dr. Dickey, uh, Dr. McLennan. I gave you mine. Let's hear what Bill's was. <laughs> no, it saves time. Dr. <laughs> um, you know, I'd say that there's nothing clearer than the way that we used to do things, uh, the way that we used to look out and treat each other, um, our behaviors, our culture uh, is going through a fundamental change. Um, I would suggest to embrace the change and be a positive um, outlook on it um, and uh, to be a positive force to help advance things in the right direction. And uh, it's really easy, I think, to, to get uh, sad and um, when you look around being distanced from people you're close to, et cetera. And uh, nothing is more compelling to me uh, right now. You know, having just become a father in the last um, week um, than to uh, really uh, leave things better for our, our progeny, whether it's my IR trainees or, or my own children. Thank you, sir. Um, and.
Lastly, I think uh, we have several questions on slido.com that will be addressed in the second part of the webinar. Um, and a very special thank you to all our panelists who've spoken thus far. We are deeply grateful that you have taken the time from your families and busy lives um, to uh, come and address our concerns. Uh, Drs. Breen, Dickey, McLennan, and Majdalani, Y'all are, of course, welcome to stay tuned for the next hour of the webinar, which will focus on the application process itself. Otherwise, uh, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and I look forward to meeting you all in the future. Um, and if anybody is uh, interested in staying, Dr. V is actually caught in a case, so we could uh, benefit from an additional panelist. Um, Dr. Breen, thank you. I have my understanding is that you're, you'd like to stay for the second part. And Dr. Donna D'Souza is with us today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, otherwise, uh, to the other panelists, thank you. Uh, if you're able to stay, great. If not, uh, it was great speaking with you. Thank you again. Um, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Have a great night. So for the next part of the webinar, um, for part two, we will run similarly to our first segment. We will go into further detail on how applicants are assessed and how to obtain letters of recommendation, topics that students may find especially important during their third and fourth years. So for our second round of panelists, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our value panelists for the second part. Um, as I mentioned uh, moments ago, we really appreciate the time that you volunteered to guide and mentor us through this complex application process. So thank you so much. Um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about yourself. So Dr. D'Souza, uh, your name, name of your institution and something you'd like to share about yourself or your program. Um, okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, yes. Okay, um, so I'm Donna D'Souza. I'm the IR program director um, at the University of Minnesota. Um, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I guess a couple of things I would share about my program, I'll share two things if you don't mind. One is that we are nice. <laughs> we are an extremely collegial uh, group of people who care deeply about our trainees um, and our trainees get treated very well. And the, the second thing I would share is in, in just something about our program is that um, we have very broad exposure to all, all facets of IR. Um, our trainees do a lot of PAD, uh, semiotic endographs, as well as the, the you know, the standard um, uh, uh, procedures, so IO and TIPS and vascular malformation work and um, prostate embolization. So it's a very broad exposure to a lot of uh, different facets. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. And Dr. Amashtalani and Dr. Wynn uh, have agreed to stay on for the second half, and they'll be taking the spots for Dr. V and Dr. Wynn are currently uh, in cases. Right. And uh, we'll start off by talking about fourth year clerkships. A lot of the questions on Slido have uh, been about this topic and how should applicants navigate the lack of OA rotations and they don't have IR rotations at home, so what should they do? So as a PD, how do you assess a student's performance on IR and DR rotations? What are common mistakes you've seen students make during these rotations? For applicants to IR or DR residency are any of the following red flags. So no home IR rotation, no home DR rotation. And uh, if one of those rotations is completed after year as is, is submitted, how can this rotation affect uh, their application? Dr. D'Souza, we'll start with you. Um, you know, I would say, you know, as I guess as a program director, like on, an, on a rotation, I would say everything, um, like sorry on that during that regarding the first question so I'm just reading all the questions here um, in terms of assessing their performance on their rotations I would say all of it is important uh, to me and our and our pa our panel of um, applicant ass application assessments assessors I should say um, so grades um, their the comments on their rotations and the letters of reference are all sort of equally um, as important. I would say the most common mistake that I've seen students make during rotations is that they fade into the background. Um, um, everybody has different personalities. Some people are more outgoing, some people are shy and everything in between. Some people are a bit nervous. 
but the problem when you sort of fade into the background is that it can make you look disengaged or disinterested um, and it's hard for us to tell whether you're shy or you're just not really engaged and so my recommendation would be to try and come out of your shell a little bit and jump into cases ask questions and so forth um, and just try and look as engaged as you can otherwise people will you know people won't remember you when it comes to interview season and and remember you as being you know an engaged student who was keen on IR um, I personally don't think that doing a IRD rotation not doing one in your home institution is a red flag as long as you've done a rotation or two or some class people have done more um, in IR and DR to me it doesn't matter where you do it um, and I guess a fourth question you know if um, a rotation is completed after ERS is submitted how does it affect your application well I guess simply that the information is not available to us so if um, you if, if it's done after you submitted your application, then one thing that I would recommend that you do is um, just email the programs, particularly the ones that you're interested in and say, hey, I did this rotation, I just want to let you know, I did this rotation and this is what happened. Um, otherwise, we have no way of knowing if it's not in your application. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. Um, and we just had Dr. Wynn join us. Dr. Wynn, uh, are you able to hear me? And is your mic working okay? We can uh, move on to Dr. Bream while Dr. Wynn uh, works out his microphone. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, Thank you, Dr. Green. Oh, of course. Um, so, you know, again, I think this is uh, one of the most difficult parts of this. It's probably um, one of the biggest casualties of COVID um, uh, that I, you know, gosh, I don't even know where to start. Um, I, I can tell you that I'm, I'm going to just skip ahead to the, for applicants to IRD or residency or any of the following red flags and no home IR rotation, no home DR rotation. Um, you know, I can tell you that those types of things are buried pretty deep in your application, um, and are very difficult to kind of ascertain. I, I don't necessarily go through your entire USMLE transcript to see what courses you've taken um, and that sort of stuff. I, I, I'm Again, I try and do a very holistic approach where I look at your personal statement, I look at your letters of recommendation, I look at research, I look at volunteer opportunities, and um, look at your, uh, your board scores. And from that, I try and figure out, would you be a good fit for our residency? Um, and that's really where uh, the applicant pool comes from. We are going to be at a severe disadvantage, both you guys and us, in the fact that you can't do these way of rotations. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer for it. I'll be really on, honest with you. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really interested as we go forward to the virtual interviews that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, how that, how that, how you come across on that. Um, but, uh, you know, it, red flags, you know, there's not a lot of red flags. Um, it, there's obvious red flags, but, but again, you just have to kind of take a step back and look at the entire applicant. Um, and that's and that's really where it comes comes down to. And so I'll just go back to what I what I reiterated on the on the first hour of our call, which is find something that you are passionate about that separates you from the from the crowd and broadcast it. Uh, I think that's all I can really say. Thank you, Dr. Green. That was that was really informative. I think yeah, it's a very tough scenario to navigate, and um, we we'll have to try our best, I guess, to work it out. Dr. Wynn, uh, anything to add? regarding these questions? Uh, first off, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. 
Okay, thank, thank you for having me. I apologize for the technical difficulties I was having at the onset there. Um, and to answer your question, I don't really have anything to add uh, on, on this slide to what Drs. D'Souza and Bream already discussed. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Wynn, would you mind introducing yourself since we uh, missed that slide a little bit earlier? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, my name is David Wynn. Um, so I'm an associate program director for an ESIR only program at Baylor College of Medicine in, in the Texas Medical Center. Um, and so we have uh, four ESIR residents out of our 12 uh, total DR residents each year. Um, Thank you, sir. Um, we'll move on to personal statements. Uh, so in the 2021 uh, cycle, how important are personal statements compared to previous years for interviews, for match rankings? What are the most important things an applicant's personal statement can tell you? What are the common mistakes that people can make uh, in their personal statements? Would you recommend writing distinct personal statements or integrated IR programs uh, versus DR residency programs? And uh, Dr. D'Souza. Um, you know, I would say in this match cycle um, that the personal statements are, you know, initially I thought, you know, when, when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking they would be the same, but I think they are more important than ever because other things like letters of reference and um, you know, the, from away rotations are going to play less of a role or less of a significant role because of the limitations in the ability to do away rotations and, and so forth. Um, so I think it might have, I would imagine it would have more waiting uh, for, um, for our program. It's mostly for, uh, you know, interviews, you know, who we select to interview, but to some degree for match rankings. I would say you know that the personal statement is important. The most important thing that they can that it can well, the personal statement is important because it's the only component of the application that you can really tailor and put your personal stamp on, and you can tell your story, who you are, why you got into what liked IR, what you like, what you you know, um, any particular interests, any particular geographic interests. Um, and I think the most important things that I look for, or we look for in my institution, is how interested in IR uh, is the applicant? What have they done to sort of get involved in IR and to expose themselves to IR? Two, uh, do they have an appreciation for DR? You know, it's very important that you enjoy the imaging side of our specialty as well. Um, and the other thing is to um, your do you have an interest in my program or my geographic area, which is, for example, in the Midwest, um, which you can indicate on your personal statement that can be tailored to each individual program. I think one of the common mistakes that applicants do is they don't do that. Um, because, I mean, I assume it hasn't changed, but you can put it, give a, you know, you can write a, you can change your personal statement for any given program. So if you have particular interest in a particular geographic area or particular program you can actually put that in your personal statement i wouldn't do it for every program you apply to because then we don't need to lie you know even to be honest oh sorry i just muted myself um but if you are particularly interested on the east coast or the west coast or the midwest or florida you should put that in the programs in that area so that we can tell you know we can tell that you are interested in coming to our program the other mistake I would say applicants make is they make, they do a generic radiology personal statement. And I, this leads into the final question where absolutely, I think that you should uh, write two distinct personal statements for the IR program and the DR program because they're not the same residency. Uh, they're completely separate programs that just happen to have some overlap. It's the same way that if you, um, you wouldn't write the same personal statement if you apply to IR or vascular and vascular surgery, or if you apply to vascular surgery and a, another surgical specialty, you would write it tailored to that particular specialty. And it's the same for IR and DR. You know, for the DR personal statement, you wanna focus on your enjoyment and appreciation of the imaging, um, even though you might wanna say that you like procedures. Um, and then for the IR, you really wanna focus on your interest in the procedural aspect of the of the specialty whilst also mentioning that you enjoy the imaging because if you write the same generic 
radiology personal statement, it can be misconstrued by either specialty. Like I've seen ones where it, it looks like they sent the same one to the IR and DR program. In fact, they have because I can look at, you know, the, the IR and the DR applications. And then I'm wondering, do they really want to do IR or do they really want to do DR? And so you can't, you know, and so it's not, it actually, I think, is not helpful to your application if you don't tailor it and show, you know, and show what you're really interested in. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. Um, Dr. Wynn, would you mind taking the next question? Uh, sure. I, I think um, what I'm looking for in a personal statement is tell me your story. I mean, I, I know I know that you're interested in IR because um, we got your application, but I want to I want to hear about you. I want to hear what you know. Tell me how you got to the point where you're at. Give me your background. Give me give me things besides, you know, I did an IR rotation and liked it. Well, I, I that's why you're uh, that's why I'm looking at your application. Thank you. Um, and then we will move on to the next slide, which discusses letters of recommendation. So in place of Dr. V, um, we will have Dr. Majdalani. Uh, talking. Dr. Mashalani, are you there? Okay, Dr. Breen, would you mind taking this question? Seems like Dr. Mashalani's phone is disconnected. Dr. Wynn, I apologize for the technical difficulties, y'all. Yeah. Um, sure so in the 2021 um, 20, cycle, how important are letters of recommendation compared to previous years? And uh, what are the most important things letters of recommendation uh, tell you about the applicant? Yeah, I think um, the, the second part of that question, uh, for letters of recommendation, I think um, the things that, that it tells me is how do, you, how do you interact with members of the team, other members of the healthcare team? Um, and I think Dr. Bream mentioned in the in the last session, um, you know, work ethic. I think that's a huge, uh, huge component of letters of recommendation. I think, um, you know, you want people to write you letters that know you well. And and I think it's, you know, it's good, you know, to have letters from, if not an IR, from a surgical subspecialty, something with a procedural aspect that, that can attest to your interest in kind of the procedural aspect of what we do. But you know, if you've got a letter writer that knows you well and knows your work ethic and really can provide some good commentary on that, I think that carries a lot of weight as well. Oh, thank you, Dr. Wynn. Uh, Dr. Mashalani, were you able to connect your microphone? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was uh, I was oh. muted there. Um, I'm going to uh, build on what uh, uh, David said, and and I think the most important letter is from somebody who knows you well and can speak to you your character um, as well as your work ethic. It doesn't necessarily have to be an IR, but I would have a variety of letters. Um, in my own application, I look back at it. I had one letter from a DR, um, which actually ended up being the most underwhelming letter of them all. Um, you know, I, I got advice from people who were the year ahead of me said, oh, everybody has to get a letter from this person because they're like the most famous radiologist here. So I did my rotation. I sat there, watched them, there the readouts, et cetera. And I was at one of my interviews, and um, the interviewer was like showing me the letter, and the letter says, "I think Bill has a sincere interest in radiology," and that was it. It's literally a three-line letter from DR. <laughs> so, um, with that said, I had um, a great letter from uh, a surgeon who I spent multiple weeks with, um, doing intense, long cases, uh, from the associate program director of internal medicine, uh, from my research mentor, etc. So. Um, I don't think you have to have like three letters from IR or DR, et cetera. I think have one from radiology, um, have a few from surgery and medicine, um, and then one from somebody who just uh, knows you well. And um, I think it, again, speaks to your character as well as your well-roundedness, as well as your overall consistency of uh, performance throughout, the, uh, throughout your medical school. I think that's what's really uh, important. Thank you, Dr. Meshalani. Um, on to the next question of uh, also letters of recommendation. So without a ways and less opportunities for IR and DR rotations, um, how are students supposed to navigate this? So when it comes to choosing the right program, 
applicants are uh, uh, applicant how should students obtain letters of recommendation in the setting of without these away rotations and for applicants to IR DR residency are any of the following red flags uh, and why all letters of uh, letter of recommendation by IR uh, no LORs by IR none by DR or none by surgeon I think Dr. Uh, Majdalani, you touched on that. Uh, Dr. Wynn and then Dr. D'Souza, would you all mind uh, talking about this a little bit? Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, students without an IR program or rotation at their home institution, it, it, you know, it's a tough spot to be in. And I think we all acknowledge that. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, if you, if you can get you know, one of your letters, um, you know, of a, of a rotation, a surgical subspecialty, et cetera, where you have some procedural experience. And, you know, another option is if, you know, if, if you have a DR rotation where you have the, op the opportunity to spend some time in IR, even if it's not a designated IR rotation, um, you know, that can be beneficial as well from a, from a letter of recommendation perspective. Um, as far as any of those scenarios, you know, representing red flags, all LORs by IRs, um, I, I don't really, I don't really see a lot of red flags as far as letters of recommendation go. I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, I agree with what Bill said on the last uh, slide that you probably should have one letter from radiology, you know, whether that's D or IR, but, um, just go back to what we said earlier, just, just people that, that know you well, and that will, that know of your, of your merits and know of your work ethic that will, that will really support you through the process. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Dr. D'Souza, anything to add? Um, yeah, I think, you know, the first question, how could you obtain letters of recommendation with no way rotations? You know, it's, I think, I mean, just specifically, this is for, like, for, I, you know, getting an IR, LOR, um, which, you know, is, is most desirable. I think some of the things to think about if you haven't done an away rotation is have you had any interaction with the IR department at all at your institution or even in a neighboring institution, for example? Did you have a mentor? Did you do any research with the, um, the IR department, um, either at your home institution or some other institution? Um, were you involved with anybody um, through your involvement in SIR, if you're on the Medical Student Council or the Reserves? Uh, were you involved with any of the faculty? Do they know you because you work together on something? Um, um just any sort of any contact you've had you could like at least you get one letter you could have them write you a letter if you've had if they've worked with you in some capacity but just have them like it'll have them write it but you know with the caveat that they didn't observe you clinically but you did work with them and expressed you know your keenness for ir um so that would be something that i think would be totally acceptable um but you know we understand that not everybody's going to be able to do that um yeah, I would also uh, agree um, with Dr. Wynn that none of those are red flags, but I don't personally like when every, someone's put, uh, you know, sent in four LORs or three LORs by IRs, because it's if it's all IR, then it's really quite a narrow, one-eyed view of your performance. It's not a sort of, it doesn't give us a holistic, sort of well-rounded view of, of, of your performance and what you're like. Um, and so I think it's a, I think that's a little bit of overkill um, in general. Um, no LOR by an IR is obviously not ideal, but in this current climate, it would have to be acceptable. And I think every program director would understand that. Um, it, it is helpful. I, I particularly, and my program particularly likes to see a letter, an LOR from a diagnostic radiologist for a few reasons. One is that we want to know that you've been exposed to, to, to DR and that we want to know if you, we want to see that you, you know, that you appreciate the imaging side of our specialty and that you enjoy the diagnostic side because if you don't, then um, you are probably going to struggle through the first three years of the residency and then most jobs out there are combined IRDR jobs and so it would limit your, your job um, prospects. But the other thing to remember is that um, on the interview panel and often on the application review panel is a diagnostic radiologist. Um, and so they are also looking to know that you would be a good fit for the DR side of their program. And so it's important to express that in your application somehow. And one of the things is, is a letter, um, is, is a DR um, letter. And then the other thing I wanna say is I think it's important to have at least one non-radiology um, 
LOI, which I think people have mentioned. And one of the things I particularly look for is, um, you know, things that we sometimes don't see in radiology letters, like what you were like on rounds, you know, what your notes were like, uh, your punctuality, bedside manner. Bedside manner is a big one. You'll often find, like, even with a family practice letter, they'll write, you know, so-and-so is great with talking to patients, talking to families. And that's really important to hear because we're such a clinical specialty that having reading that about applicants is really important. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. Um, next slide, we'll be talking about choosing the right program. So when it comes to choosing the right program, applicants to IR rated how important certain factors were to ranking their programs uh, back in the 2018 match. That's what this table here shows. Um, many of these metrics are gauged through OAs and in-person interviews. So how should students learn about programs, faculty, and staff at their programs of interest? Given the virtual nature of interviews, how do you advise applicants to best assess whether this residency program would be a good fit for them? And before interviewing, how can an ap applicant find residency programs for which she or he is a good match in terms of competitiveness, in terms of personality and culture? And lastly, what will your program do to give students a feel for your program or institution if interviews will be done remotely or virtually? Um, and Dr. D'Souza. Um, yeah, so one of the, I mean, there's multiple ways to learn about, I know this, it's kind of, it's not the same, it doesn't replace an elective, but, um, you know, how could students learn about programs, faculty and stuff? So some institutions, including my own, will be are doing virtual electives, and so you should sign up for those, uh, particularly, you know, in, uh, if you're interested in that particular program or geographic area. Um, and then obviously, you know, every program has a website and their student forums. But one of the things I would encourage people to do is contact the program directly if you have an interest in that program, um, either the program coordinator, you could email a program director. Like I have no problem if people want to email me and ask more questions about the program or some of the current residents. Um, and in fact, like my program, I've asked my residents to be available so that if people contact me and ask about the program, I can also have them talk to, to students um, just to ask questions, what it's like, you know, to be a resident, what sort of, what the cases are like, what the faculty are like, um, and they will be, you know, so they'll be willing to do it by email or phone. And so, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to the programs that you're interested in to find out a little bit more by directly contacting them. Um, you know, I would say that um, in terms of, you know, a, assessing whether the program is a good fit for you. When I think about it, I think the only things missing from not doing in-person interviews is that you don't, for one, you don't get to see the physical space of the department and the equipment, but you also don't get to observe how the staff and the faculty and residents interact. Other than that, I, I imagine you will have the same information to determine whether it's a good fit for you by talking to the faculty to, and asking questions during the interview, talking to the residents, um, and 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 looking, you know, looking in, in, in through those, um, you know, those factors and and doing a virtual tour as well. So I don't think, other than those two things I mentioned, I think you'll still have the same amount of information. It just won't be face to face. Um, and then I just wanted to say, like, our, our department is, is certainly doing um, virtual tours and Zoom chats with residents on interview day, which I imagine most programs will. Hey, Dr. Oh, D'Souza, this, this is uh, Peter Green. I, I wanted to ask you real quick. You had mentioned that you are planning on doing virtual, um, uh, or virtual electives or virtual rotations. Can you talk a little more about that? Because this is not something that we have thought about. Okay, so what we are planning, it's sort of in the making, is doing um, so like live lectures with the faculty. So people sign up as though they would for a proper elective. We do um, live lectures like a few hours a day um, where the faculty and the residents give lectures. Um, and then we are going to have like uh, chat rooms, I guess, where the, they can chat to me one-on-one -on -one or my associate program director one-on-one -on -one or a bunch of residents and just ask about the program and talk about cases um, and then we'll also do a, a virtual tour um, and so that's kind of the essential components of our virtual elective that we're trying to put together. Thank you Dr. D'Souza. Um, Dr. V actually just joined the webinar. Dr. V are you able to uh, speak with your mic?
All right. Um, well, we'll get back to Dr. V in a moment. Um, Dr. Mashtalani, do you have anything to add, or Dr. Wynn? Any anybody have anything to add to this slide before we move on to virtual Hello? interviews? Dr. V, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Sorry. Reggie. Uh, hey, how is everyone doing? Good to virtually see you all. Um, so, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question real quick? I just, yes, so uh, the discussion topic was choosing the right program. When it comes to oh, choosing yeah. the right program, how are important certain factors were at ranking uh, for students? Um, so without away rotations and with virtual interviews, how do we circumvent that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a brilliant question. Um, I think what you have to do, uh, I, I think when you, you lose the feel of the program, the passion of the program, et cetera, uh, one of the key things is to talk to the residents at various levels in the integrated program. So talk to the kind of the juniors and then the kind of the fives and, you know, potentially sixes and get a, get a feel from them what they feel. If uh, there's former students who rotated a program, ask them what the programs are, are like, you know, so you can get some information from like last year's MS4s or the year before MS4s who can give you some insider information as to what they, and they've matched somewhere else and what they kind of thought of the program. So I think any way you can kind of sort that out. Also, if you have an opportunity, like different programs are weighted to different types of procedures. For example, if you're really just neurointerventional, then you want to look at the case logs of, and what the uh, aptitude for neurointerventional is at that program. If you're interested in, you know, pediatrics, look and see what the availability of that is. And so also your kind of subdivisions of interest should be reflected in, and kind of that. And then finally, kind of look at the kind of autonomy that the trainee gets at what level and their case log. So I encourage you to kind of look or ask, hey, can I see one of the senior residents case logs or junior residents case log and see what they're doing? Are they primary or secondary assist? And that'll give you some kind of data as well. But it is, I personally think it's a little challenging with that kind of being in that environment. But I agree with Dr. D'Souza, kind of doing these kind of um, Zoom chats and kind of Zoom happy hours or whatever, where you can kind of meet and greet the residents across uh, uh, in that fashion, maybe what we'll have to do as well. Thank you, Dr. V. Um, moving on to virtual interviews, also a very hot topic. Uh, so with virtual interviews have being encouraged by the APDIR and APDR, what are your thoughts on virtual interviews? Will interviews bear the same amount of importance as compared to prior years? And do you foresee exceptions to these interviews, such as students with close ties or special interests in the program or uh, geographically proximal institutions? Dr. V, would you mind continuing? Yeah, no, I think it's a, a, another great question. So I think, you know, there's always some uh, geographic bias noted in uh, the interview process just because when we are uh, interviewing, people tend to want to be either where their family's from or, or you know, where they, you know, they have some connection or link. So... Uh, that's something that does occur, whether it be West Coast, Midwest, East Coast, South. It's something just to be aware of. Um, and then as far as how is the virtual interviews going to impact things, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I really don't know because I've never done virtual interviews. So um, I think that we'll still be able to talk over the phone, over over the Internet and still have some, uh, you know, idea of how the responses are, et cetera, whether it's, a you know, some kind of fit or not. So I think we'll still have some idea, but since I haven't done it, I haven't gone through the process, I really, to be honest with you, I won't know what it's like. It'll be as new for me as it is for those of you out there. Dr. Wynn? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just to I'll echo that, it's a new process for everyone. I think, you know, looking at the positive, it's gonna be a, a significant, significantly reduced financial burden on the candidates not having to, to travel as much. Um, as far as, you know, bearing the same amount of importance, it's tough to say. I mean, you know, we've, we've already seen with myself technical difficulties in, in joining these virtual meetings sometimes. So, you know, I think there are going to be some hiccups that we'll just have to, uh, to account for. Um, but, you know, I, I think, um, you know, what's not lost is just the one-on-one -on -one kind of contact and conversation that, that you can have irrespective of whether you're sitting across a desk from someone. Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Lin. And uh, Dr. Bream and Dr. Mashtalani, thank you for hanging on. Do you have anything to add regarding virtual interviews? You know, one thing I'll uh, say is, um, you know, this past year, <clears throat> or actually just through this independent residency match, you know, we got about halfway through with in-person interviews, and the second half were done virtually. 
And I know a lot of people had concerns that, oh, am I at a disadvantage because I did the interviews virtually? And we actually found that about um, half of our top 20 were virtual interviews and half of them were in-person interviews. So I didn't feel like it actually changed anything. Um, it actually gave applicants a lot more flexibility. If they wanted to talk to more people, we actually opened it up more and just said, you know, this is your interview day. Uh, and they'd say, oh, you know, I really wanted to talk to this person as well. I was like, that's fantastic. Tell you what, why don't we set up an extra time for you to chat with that person, um, not on your interview day. So uh, it does offer some flexibility and some nimbleness. It is going to um, save applicants some money. It's also going to save us some money. Um, so there are some, you know, some mild positives here. Um, at the end of the day, I actually felt like I still got to know the applicants uh, quite well. So um, the, I think the biggest thing that's lost is you guys uh, as applicants don't get to experience the culture and, and the visit of a place. And I think that's a really important thing to know it, if you have a gut feeling like, you know, this would be a good fit for me. I'm happy living in this city. The environment is good. The cost of living, um, the types of things that I like to do are found around here. I have a support system, et cetera. So I think some of those elements are going to be a little bit harder for you to gauge. Um, but as an interviewer, I actually felt uh, very comfortable doing um, interviews uh, via phone or, and or FaceTime. So. That's very so I, sure. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I, I think I might just kind of take the opposite view of here. Um, this uh, could of course, absolutely, Peter, of course, of course, you know me. I mean, come on. Um, no, absolutely. I think that this actually could be a disaster. And the way I say that, the reason I say that is because all of the financial constraints of visiting places are gone now. So what is, mm -hmm. why not, you know, uh, apply to 200 programs? Would you mind Why pausing? That's actually the topic of our next slide. Now I'd love to hear your oh, thoughts on okay. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, let's so that. let's see, where is that? Um, so in it's prior, not. actually, it's not this one. It's the next one, uh, but we'll buzz <laughs> to it for a second. Right, so in prior that. years, highly competitive students rejected interview invitations due to a finite time and financial resources. The theoretical limitation will be significantly reduced with these virtual interviews, resulting in a phenomenon called application inflation. Com yes. Competitive applicants hoarding interviews and rank spots for a hospital. So um, will your program implement any measures to combat this phenomenon? Are you limiting the number of interview spots offered like emergency medicine has done? Um, how will this relatively new system of interviewing impact how you evaluate students? And what recommendations would you have for virtual interviews? All right, let me take this. So um, this this actually was something that we dealt with uh, in the first round of IR um, integrated residencies. Uh, at Vanderbilt, when I was there, we were one of the top, but we were the third program to get accreditation and we participated in the very first match. Um, and then as the match grew over the next few years, one thing that we found was that the top 60 or 70 applicants applied to every single IR program because there were only 60 programs and or even 40 programs just to start off with. And we all found that we were all trying to fight for the same number of residents. Mm -hmm. um, I think the exact opposite may happen in this year, which is without that constraint, what's going to keep people from trying to apply and what's you know and so we are looking at do we open up our interviews for way more interviews this year um i think we are going to try and mimic our interviews that we've done in the past as much as possible meaning we'll have a introductory with the uh, program director uh, we will do a live uh, PowerPoint presentation with the chief residents kind of espousing the wonderfulness of UNC and Chapel Hill and living in this area. Uh, and then we'll break off into rooms and do interviews. Uh, and then we're thinking about doing even br uh, uh, rooms, uh, kind of subject rooms where the, the interviewees can go into different rooms and we'll have a topic for each room to discuss. Um, but that that's a half a day. That's not it. So 
we can't really, and we interviewed 104 people last year. Um, so that was a lot of time to do that. Um, so uh, I think that um, we really have to think through this and we really have to kind of figure out exactly, are we gonna try and, and mimic what we did before? Or are we gonna break out of the box and do something totally different where we offer interviews from eight to midnight on a on a weeknight, or are we going to interview on a Saturday or a Sunday? Because all of the constraints about the workday are gone. Mm-hmm. Thank you, all Dr. Bream. That's thoughts, really interesting you know? to hear. Yeah, um, Dr. D'Souza, would you mind uh, speaking on this question? Um, yeah, I mean, we we sort of have similar concerns that. Now that there's no people don't you know students don't have to book flights and hotels there's no geographic constraint to where they can where they will you know where they'll apply and 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 accept interviews and so we are expecting that the number will be you know higher because people can just apply you know conveniently and interview conveniently everywhere um, and so you know I think what we're going to try and do is is Prob- well, what I'm hoping we can do is keep our interview structure the same, the same number of spots and the same structure, like Dr. Bream said, you know, where we have an introductory um, lecture on our program and then we have um, we have interviews, you know, one-on-one interviews and then we have like a chat room where they meet the residents, which we used to be the lunch that the residents took them to. Um, but the question for us is actually going to be who out of the people that interview that are applying really want to come to our program um, because we you know want to interview people who are genuinely interested in coming to us and we know would might be happy you know here and so we tend to anyway take a holistic approach we don't just screen by board scores or anything like that we do a very holistic approach looking you know at academic performance but also personal statements and you know personality traits and and you know uh, volunteer work and so forth and so I don't think that we will be uh you know I, I don't think that we'll all be interviewing like the same group of people um if if we take a holistic approach personally um I so that's kind of my take on it it's I don't I don't know if they'll be hoarding or not, but I know that we're not going to, we're going to be specifically trying to distinguish which students are interested in our program and which are just applying because they can, you know, and so we don't know how much it's going to occur, but I think it might occur a lot. And so that's, that's going to be our focus. Thank you for chiming in on that. Dr. V, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with the the others. It does take some barrier away from applying to a specific program. Uh, the caveat is it does give the trainees like a, a kind of a bird's eye view as many programs as possible, and they may identify some gems and may identify things that they didn't expect. And so there are some pluses, but from our standpoint, as, as uh, people doing the interviews, the challenge is, like you said, the time involved. It's taking away from our kind of clinical time where we're taking care of patients. So I, I, do, I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but I do think it'd be nice to know who's kind of interested in the program in some fashion or not, you know. So one thing that I was thinking about is maybe having a supplemental packet, identifying people who are truly interested in your program uh, with a few questions here or there, you know, it says why you're interested, et cetera. So something of that nature, something I've considered. But again, I'm really looking to the APDR and APDR, see if they have any additional kind of guides and looking at what other uh, subspecialty surgical groups are doing to identify it because, you know, IRA has become kind of a surgical subspecialty from the procedural standpoint. So I want to see what neurosurgery and ortho and ENT and urology are going to do because I'm probably going to try to reflect that pattern. It's really great to hear everybody's thoughts on that. I think it's a very interesting conversation and we won't know how it'll play out until it plays out. Um, Moving on to the next slide and uh, this one will be covering students applying IR share a unique scenario where they are encouraged to dual apply IR and DR. So what suggestions would you have for students in regards to applying both IR, DR in light of current events? And do you suggest that students apply to more programs than normal now that interviews are likely to be virtual? Uh, additionally, based on your experience as a PD, how should students decide how many programs to apply to, IR, DR? Um, and should they apply to both of those programs at their top ranked institutes? Um, Dr. V. Dr. V. 
Would you mind starting us on this? Dr. Yeah, Ray, I mean, you, I think oh, in most go. places, oh, sorry. So I, I think in general, it's um, especially if the DR program has ESIR, it's probably not unreasonable, you know? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so in general, most of the uh, most places they would advocate of dual applying. Um, I don't think it's, crit it's it's absolutely necessary, but in general, that's been the trend. You apply to IR, you apply to IRDR. So then the DRPDs uh, interview as, as well as the IRPDs. Now, if you're really focused on just kind of the IR program and that's where you want to go and not necessarily as, as key because people may be more geographically um, available to go elsewhere for IR versus DR, I don't think that's wrong either, you know, to kind of split it. Now, as far as ESIR, the things that I think are important is going, and there's a lot of variability in the ESIR programs, one. Two is uh, there's only so many independent residencies available. So I would look at programs that have independent spots also as the SIR. And um, because you want to, if you potentially could kind of uh, almost transfer in or kind of uh, uh, match into that if you do well, I think that's a, a consideration. Um, uh, also, you want to see what is the kind of vitality of the DSIR program, meaning how many blocks are you going to do? What is your uh, case log going to look like? Because what we're seeing come from the independent standpoint, there's, a, again, a lot of variability in the skill set of the trainees coming out of ESR compared to some of the integrated. Thank you, Dr. Z. Um, Dr. Wynn? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I do think there's a lot of variability in the, in the uh, ESR training uh, that's out there. Um, as far as applying to both IR and DR, I really think it depends on you know, a lot of it depends on geography. I mean, if there's an area that, you know, you really want to see yourself in for training, then I think it definitely behooves you to, to dual apply. Um, and that's, uh, you know, what I would suggest. Thank you, sir. And uh, then on to our last slide before taking any questions from Slido. Um, our, for our final slide, we'll address any bonus advice you have for students during this application process. What advice would you offer to students with unique application characteristics, such as IMGs, DO candidates, applicants without IR at their institution, applicants who are couple matching, and applicants concerned about portions of their CV? Um, especially popular on slido.com has been uh, the questions regarding IMGs and those individuals uh, without IR at their institution. Dr. Wynn. Uh, yeah, so the, um, you know, IMGs are not, in, at least in our program, are not, you know, regarded any differently through the screening um, process. Um, we've had, we've had multiple IMGs over the last several years, many of whom have been stellar residents. Um, so I think it, it probably depends on the individual program there. Um, you know, we tend to look at um, the letters of recommendation um, pretty closely for for IMGs in our institution. Um, as far as no IR at your institution, I think, you know, Dr. D'Souza touched on that earlier, just with, you know, if you've worked with somebody at a, at a state or national kind of uh, institutional level um, that could advocate for you, that's uh, one thing to consider. Um, I'll just also mention that, that we've at Baylor historically been a very DO friendly program. I mean, our section chief and IR is a DO. So it's, again, it's one of those things that just depends on depends on the individual program. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Dr. D'Souza. Um, yeah, our program is also very DO friendly. Um, we, I, we don't distinguish between MD and DO candidates at all. Some of our strongest, brightest uh, residents and fellows have been DOs. Um, you know, I guess the advice I would give um, is that if you have any, if you haven't been able to do an IR, um, rotation at your institution or anywhere um, or you know you have limited concerns regarding your scores or not being able to do research or so forth the best thing you can do is explain it or, or sort of discuss it in your personal statement um, we all know that there's going to be some uh, restrictions because of COVID and what people can and can't get exposed to. But it is nice, you know, just to say and 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 just to mention in your personal statement that despite these things, this is why you are um, you are um, dedicated to pursuing the career a career in interventional radiology. Um, and I think that is really helpful for us to. Um, 
you know, just to, to understand you better and where you're coming from and what limitations you have, but, you know, how you've kind of overcome that. And so that would be my advice on that. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. I think you addressed a lot of the questions actually just posted on Slido, so that was great. Dr. V? Um, yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of it. I think we're looking at um, you know, kind of the strongest uh, applicants, especially in the international kind of world. I do think couples matching, uh, it becomes a unique challenge. So in general, you, uh, you need to apply more broadly. Um, and I'm not sure how that's going to reflect in this year's Kind of system, but in general, you're going to have to apply more broadly just because of the nature of the couples matching. No IR institution, you have to, uh, because we have to see that you're interested. So either some IR research, it's challenging because the SR unfortunate meeting was canceled. You know, being joining uh, different webinars or um, like the Jess webinar, or this webinar, or that webinar are important things to kind of showcase your involvement. Um, and so I think anything like that is helpful. What is your fourth year look like? Are you doing you know, have you done a surgical rotation, or ICU rotation? Maybe if you don't have uh, IR, at least vascular surgery, some type of catheter skilled thing where you're like, hey, this is what I want to do. Because uh, in theory, it all looks good, but you want to make sure that this is the right fit before you apply to integrated IR residency. So either interventional cardiology, interventional neuroradiology, vascular surgery, they're all similar kind of endovascular procedures. So in some sense, I do encourage that at your local program. And a, you know, a letter from some type of endovascular specialist showcase, hey, your passion, interest, your work ethic, et cetera, would be helpful. And so that's kind of things that I think are important if you don't have a local IR program, considering what's going on right now. Thank you, Dr. V. Dr. Majdala, oh, Dr. Bream, do you have any questions? I heard you talking. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to point out something recently that um, the, uh, SIR has got a wonderful uh, mentor program, and uh, I have met several um, medical students across the country who uh, have reached out to me, um, and uh, I have monthly Zoom calls with these re uh, with these medical students since this has all happened. Um, one of the medical student um, brought to me a, uh, a a research idea. And uh, we latched onto it and we're writing a paper together. I've never met this individual in my life. Um, I've seen him on Zoom and we've talked many, many times. Um, so there are, there are lots of ways to get involved if you don't have, and, and they do not have IR at their institution, which is why they did this. Um, so there are opportunities out there to, uh, to go after um, experiences. And I, and I can tell you, I've been very impressed with the work ethic. Um, I know a lot of the medical students right now are twiddling their thumbs because I know at UNC they were not allowed to come into the wards and they were just basically banished to home and, and doing online activities. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And those are the types of things on your personal statement, on your application that are going to help you um, rise above. So I'll just say that. Thank you, Dr. Bream. Dr. Mishdalani, any closing thoughts? No, I'm going to echo what um, everybody else said. It's going to take some uh, creativity uh, on the part of applicants to um, get that exposure and also showcase themselves. Um, but I think a collective message that I think I've heard from nearly everybody on all the calls is, you know, we're all happy if you reach out to us, um, whether it's uh, Peter saying it through mentorship or Donna uh, saying it through, you know, I'm happy to take phone calls and emails, et cetera. I, I, I've never seen Joji turn anybody uh, back. So um, yeah, reach out to us. To and have, uh, Bill, I can't wait to have come come and have coffee with you in Atlanta. That sounds great. Yeah, I, I can't either. It's going to be on you. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think collectively uh, we're all very approachable. Um, we're all very uh, genuinely kind people who are interested in uh, both finding people who are passionate about IR and helping them develop that interest. So um, reach out to us. I think we're all happy to help you guys navigate and um, and become successful interventionalists. Thank you so much, Dr. Mustalani. A lot of people did have questions about how to reach out to mentors, and I think you, as well as the other panelists, Dr. Bream, have uh, kind of mentioned that virtually reaching out is, is a very possible means. Um, and uh, just some last final questions from slido.com. 
Uh, how would we structure a personal statement to emphasize our desire to do IR and still be able to match into a DR program with the ESIR option? So people have questions regarding personal statements if they should um, if they should specialize them for customize them for IR or for DR or have one for both. I think the same would apply for letters of recommendation. Would anybody like to take this question? I'll take it. I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's really important um, when you are crafting your personal statement. Um, I, I am impressed with people who do personalized um, uh, personal statements that mention they have ties to the area or they went to undergrad at some place you know that was close by or something like that. So I think that's really important. But um, the I, I think the the key to this is you know IR has been the most uh, competitive, especially uh, to get into in the last few years. Um, you can't be an IR without being a DR. So if you I, I think that um, if you in your personal statement talk about diagnostic radiology and then talk about your love of of procedures and that you would ultimately want to pursue intervention radiology. I think that everybody needs to be realistic in the fact that there are a lot of people, I mean, you're young, you're starting off, you're just coming out of medical school. You may not know that you want to only do IR and that's okay. And you may get in here and find a love of MSK um, radiology and therefore when you uh, do your DR program, you can just go into MSK. So I, I think that, I, I think it's fine to throw all your eggs in one basket for IR, but I think it's also fine to say, hey, I'm realistic. I'm going to be the best DR resident possible. And then I will go for my ESIR if that's what I decide to do. Um, but I also may just decide to be a, a, di a diagnostic radiologist and go into body imaging or MAMO or MSK or or, or whatever, or neuro. So uh, I think that's really important to keep that in mind. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah. I, I, um, you know, I, I sort of answered this earlier when I, in one of the other slides that um, you should, you, I don't believe that you should have the same personal statement for IR and DR. Even if you want to go into DR and then do ESIR, they're not the same program. Um, and right. so you should tailor your statement to the actual specialty that you're applying for. But when you are applying for, if you're interested in go, you know, matching into DR, if you go into ESIR, um, then just remember though that you are not applying, and I think some medical students get a little bit confused about this, that when you're applying to go into a DR program, you're not being selected for ESIR at the time of that application. You know, they're not interviewing you for ESIR, they're interviewing you for your DR program, and then you can apply to do ESIR once you're in the DR program. So your application should really just be to get into the DR program, and then you declare your interest in ESIR. I mean, you could talk about it in the interview if you want, and that's fine, but you really don't have to choose ESIR until you're in the DR program. So what I'm saying is you should just focus on applying to DR and you should talk about your love of imaging but that you also like procedures but don't ramble on and on and on about your love for IR because the DR program directors are going to go some of them are going to go well this person really wants to go into IR do I want to waste an interview spot on this person who's probably going to rank the DR program down the bottom somewhere because they really want to do IR so you've got to be a little bit kind of you have to craft it according to the specific program um, and think about who's actually reading the the, the the statement. Yeah, I mean, I, this is Joji here uh, about a contrary. So I, I, I think there's two things. One is uh, there is a little bit of gamesmanship in the sense that some DR program directors may be like, hey, uh, if they're too heavily IR bound, then maybe I won't take them. But others will be like, hey, this person's a really strong candidate, good scores, a good personality. Uh, good CV, um, good third year scores, et cetera. Um, they may be like, even if they're going to interventional in there, but they're eventually, I'll, I'll still want a strong resident who is interested in, in uh, diagnostics and IR. Um, but if there's like, a, if you're you're absolutely certain you want to do interventional, then I, you know, you should definitely have a strong statement saying that, like, hey, I want to really do a high end IR job. 
maybe whether it be academics or outpatient lab or office-based lab, because you know we're spending six years to train someone to do quite a bit. Um, and I want to know that like if you come here, you're not going to attrition to uh, switch out of IR to DR, which has happened in some programs. So when I'm looking, I'm looking. You know, this is surgery essentially. The hours are busy. It's a lot to learn, both diagnostically and clinically and interventionally. We have a bunch of unit time. So if someone's not really passionate about that, then it won't be a good fit for our program. Um, and, and if you're not certain about interventional, then I think the ESR route is a great route or the five plus two route, meaning internship, four years of diagnostic, and the two year route. Both are reasonable adjuncts. And uh, as Dr. Bream has said, there's plenty of other procedural aspects of radiology, MSK, MAMO, um, you know, body, and so on and so forth. So I think you should consider that. But if you're 100% sure, like, hey, I was either going between vascular surgery or neurosurgery or IR, then I would reflect upon that in your, you know, personal, in your personal statement, et cetera, and go for it. Thank you, Dr. V. Um, any other comments regarding this or any closing thoughts from any of the panelists? I, I will just say, um, I just want to reach out to everybody and say, um, we feel your pain. Um, uh, I can tell you as a, as a DR program director, the last few months have been the most stressful of my entire career. And um, trying to deal with COVID, uh, trying to deal with um, the fact that everything, I, mean, I think we started this whole webinar off with the fact that things change. And um, everything that we talked about tonight could be totally different in a couple of months. So um, I, I want everybody to take a collective breath realize that we all have your best interest at heart. Um, we want you to train in the best place possible and that we are going to figure this out. Um, if there's any specialty out there that could figure out an innovative way to get through this problem, it's IR. Um, and so just trust us and uh, know that we are, uh, we're working very hard and taking this very seriously. Thank you, Dr. Bream. Anyone else? Yeah, I want to echo that. I mean, these are unprecedented times in the history of the world. You know, it's been 102 years since the kind of Spanish flu and the kind of uh, unfortunate things that are going on in, the, you know, in the U.S. Are, and the world is responding. We've just not seen anything quite like this for quite some time, the combination of those two things. So I echo, like, I empathize with what the rising MS4s are going through. And uh, we certainly all, from the faculty standpoint, have uh, sympathy for, for, you know, this unprecedented issues that you're going with your training being abbreviated, abrupt, and, you know, all this uncertainty. And we're going to be very supportive of all of you through this time. So we're, we're in it with you, and we're going to get a lot of strong statements from the Associate Program Directors of Interventional Radiology very soon, the Associate Program Directors of Radiology very soon, and we'll all have some guidance on how you can navigate these kind of very unparalleled uh, um, waters, unprecedented waters. Thank you, Dr. V. Um, if there are any other comments from the panelists, uh, I'd like to extend a very special thank you to you all um, for, for coming tonight. Thank you so much for your time, your continued mentorship, and especially your words uh, during these really hard times. Uh, additionally, I'd like to give a warm thank you to Hanson Lee, uh, the previous MSC chair, Dudley Charles, who's the chair of our current DNI committee, and Alec Jost, uh, a colleague of mine at Wake Forest, for their help with the content editing. I'd also like to thank uh, Drs. Herwald and Zoe for allowing us to adapt their original slide set and reframing it in uh, the 2020 setting. For more information, questions, or comments regarding involvement or any other IR trainee related topics, uh, please reach us via email or social media. There's always room for involvement. And please, uh, complete the survey that was sent uh, at the beginning of the webinar. There's the post-webinar part of the survey. So if you wouldn't mind taking 30 seconds just to fill that out and submitting, it would really help PDs and I think us students um, to gather more information about how to approach this entire process. Um, and thank you for listening. We covered a lot of ground. I think we answered the vast majority of questions on Slido that were relevant to the webinar. Uh, we hope this answered many of your own personal questions. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. And th uh, again, thank you to all our panelists for sticking around. Yeah, thank you, Rayan, for organizing this. And I agree, I echo what uh, Dr. Majolani and Bream and D'Souza 
and Wynn uh, uh, all stated that we're readily available. And if you want to reach out to us and sort of connect or SR mentorship, uh, uh, we'd be more than happy to kind of aid you. And uh, one other thing, I'll just give you a plug to uh, NEGM 360. Right now, there's a bunch of interventional PDs on New England Journal of Medicine 360 that can also answer some questions. And there are some integrated residents as well as ESI residents on there. So they can also give you some answers and you can read some of those posts. And so I uh, ask you to look at NEGM 360 and learn some more as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keith. Great job, um, thank everybody. You again. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nice job. Thanks Nicely for having us. Thanks, y'all. Please stay safe. Have a great night.